was a lot interesting in this talk of um, yet another group of unionized workers that got screwed out of their of, of their pensions, you know. It's um, well, I mean, it's it, it's 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 legalized theft, right? I mean, I don't I don't really care what kind of argument you want to throw up. There's really no excuse for it, right? These are people that went to work every day, had money taken off of their paychecks every week to, you know, go towards a, a, a fund, and then it turns out that the corporation mismanaged the fund. It's nonsense, right? You know, if you audit this properly, um, you, you just figure out that they just blew it, right? They just stole it. That's all there is to it, right? So, so I think we need to look at this about two things that we need to talk about. This, right? You know, they're they're taking a you know, a, well, it's a there was a financial crisis, so nobody can expect it to actually pay out the money for the pensioners, as as though you know, as though that's a general revenue for the company, right? In fact. Um, there have been uh, cases in Canada, a court case in Canada, that uh, declared that um, EI is not general revenue in Canada. So the government can't take money out of it. And if that's applicable to the government, I think it should also be applicable to private companies, right? Meaning that um, if they were to push this in court, I think they would win. Um, and what it would imply would be that uh, companies would need to have, um, you know, pension funds in, uh, um, in, in separate um, accounts that are, that are inaccessible to the company and that uh, will exist, you know, beyond uh, the company's uh, bankruptcy should that occur. But, I mean, I think that um, even that is giving them too much credit. Um, I think there's been so many cases of this now that that should be um, a prerogative um, of workers um, of all types. Um, I know that um, the number of jobs that even have pensions nowadays is, is becoming uh, more and more scarce, right? But um, I, I, I think that um, the people that are working, at, um, if you are in a unionized workforce and you do have a pension, you should be fighting for union control of the pensions, okay? Take it away from the companies and 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 manage it yourselves. Um, uh, you know, you know, put it into a uh, just a different financial uh, mechanism. Uh, separate it from the companies. Uh, you know, uh, make it so that the company itself cannot access those funds. Um, so that if anything happens to the company, the union still has it. Um, and I think that that's really has to be imperative um, because we're learning that um, like it, it's it's become it, it's a business model unto itself, right? Like it happens over and over again, company after company. It's it, it's not a consequence of you know uh, you know cyclical business models or sorry cyclical business downturns, although they may use that as an excuse. It's not um, you know a consequence of a bad economy. This week or something. It's it's by design, right? Um, it's theft, organized theft, right? So the second thing is that, um, I mean, there has to be a prevention strategy, right? People, like workers need to stop pretending they can trust management like that, right? And and this is good, right? Because it's it's uh, self uh, it's, it's self management, right? And it gets, it gets people in the right mindset. You know, to, to get rid of the management class. Um, so, so I, I really think that union people, um, I forget about union leaders. They they work for the they work for management mostly, right? But 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 people need to be agitating for this, um, and that should be something that uh, gets off the ground. I, I, that that should be a movement as a reaction to these uh, incredible injustices that are happening around. Um, you know, shareholders stealing, stealing money out of pension funds. Um, 
And the second thing is there needs to be remedies um, for the theft that's occurred. Um, I, I don't care if your if your company went but bankrupt. Yeah, I don't care if your you know your the, the share value collapsed. You know, go cry me a river. You know, these people put money into their pensions and they deserve it. And there should be legal action, class action suits. Um, like if if I they're talking about a steel company here. If you tried to tell me that you're going to shortchange me on, on the pension, I'd be launching a class action suit. You know, and if it means that the shareholders have to pay into it, then so be it. And what that means ultimately, and this is my biggest issue with, uh, I'm going to change my battery because the, the light just came on. Oh, I'm in Canada. This is a Canadian uh, TV show on public television in Canada. We're talking to Canadian economists about a Canadian union um, that's getting shafted by an, uh, an American company, but it's in Canada. Um, it's U.S. Steel. Um, so, my understanding of things come from a slightly different legal... Um, no, and and I, if I haven't mentioned it, I'm sure at some point I mentioned it, but I have taken three years worth of law um, along with the uh, <laughs> dozen or so other partial degrees that I finished. I, I did finish one. I finished one degree. It was in math. And... I mean, I, it's a half credit in computer programming, so it's, I might as well finish that one too, right? But three years worth of law too. Um, maybe one day we'll sit down and work out all the credits and all the different minors I have. But there's there's, there's plenty of them, right? So I, I, if I wanted to, I could get a minor in law. I don't really care to, but... Um, meaning that when I learned about law, I learned about it from the Canadian historical perspective, which is very different. Um... I mean, it's the same up until, uh, was it 1767? Um, so there was a Royal Pro Proclamation in 1763. But I mean, um, from 1767 until 1981, um, our um, legal tradition was uh, determined by... I mean, it's, it's, it's the same basic system, right? But we didn't take precedence out of the United States. We took precedence from Great Britain. So when we learn about Canadian case law... Um, and things like corporate personhood, um, it comes to us through the filter of things that happened um, not in the United States. Um, so our concept of corporate personhood does not come out of uh, the Civil War, and it doesn't have anything to do with that. Rather, it comes out of a tort law case um, and the concept of standing, right? And there were two things that were enacted at the same time, and that in British law, are more or less the beginning of... Um, uh, it it kind of represents the transition from a, uh, from an aristocratic, you know, the type of uh, economy um, to, a, to a bourgeois liberal economy. Um, and they happen simultaneously uh, as a consequence of the same court case. Uh, it had to do with somebody... Somebody bought a, a bottle of beer and there was a... What was it a... Was it a dead rat or whatever? There was something in the, in the beer, and they sold and they sued them uh, for liability. And this is just tort law, right? Tort law. The basic rules are the same um, because they're British, right? So it's the same in Canada and the U.S. And the US because they're both British. Um, and, and and there were two things that were established. <coughs> ah, I don't know why I'm coughing so much. Um, I've quit smoking altogether. Um, I mean, I've, 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 when I say I quit, I've, I have not bought a pack of cigarettes since the first week of January. But I've, you know, had cigarettes here and there. Um, I've actually been completely cold turkey for a week. But I mean, that's it's just because I haven't been out, right? I came back on Friday morning, and it's now Saturday. It's very early Saturday morning, so eight days. Um, it's been a while since I went that long with like zero cigarettes um, because I've been out so much for the last month and a bit right but I mean I'm not I didn't even think about it you know I haven't been tired it's I, have, I haven't really felt it right so I'm over it right it's uh, 
they say it's mostly a habit, right? It's a psychological thing. There, there is a physical aspect to it, and you know, but it just makes you tired, right? The, the hard part is getting over the habit, the psychological part, and I'm, I'm done. It's like I haven't even, I haven't even wanted a cigarette for the last week, so that's good. Um, that's what I wanted to get to, and I'm going to a show on Tuesday. I'll, I, I, I'm, I'm gonna try to make it a, a, a thing to not have any. Um, well, there's one circumstance where I may have one. Anyways, I don't know, I'm going, to, I'm going somewhere where I haven't been to. Anyways, I, I think I'm coughing because of that, um, more than anything else. I have noticed that I've been producing some phlegm, so. Um, anyways, uh, what was I saying? Yeah, so two, two things brought into the law at the same time. The first was corporate personhood, um, which in the British Empire um, was actually about standing. Okay, so... You had somebody that wanted to sue a corporation. And, like I said, this is early in the transition from, you know, an aristocratic state uh, to a bourgeois state, a bourgeois liberal state, right? So the idea of suing a corporation was a novel thing. Um, it used to be, before this, that if you wanted to take legal action against... You could take legal action against people that worked... Um, in a corporation, but not against the corporation itself, right? And you can imagine how that could screw people over, right? So let's say, let's, let's consider the, the BP accident, right? Before corporate personhood, um, and according to the British rules, before corporate personhood, it's British petroleum, right? Or Anglo, Anglo Iranian oil, or whatever you want to call it. Um, they actually called it, they had the nerve to call themselves beyond petroleum for a while. Um, how about bullshit petrochemical company? Let's go with that. Um, if you consider the BP oil spell, and this is just a random example, under the old rules before corporate personhood, what would happen was that you couldn't sue the company, because how do you sue a company? What does that, what does that even mean, right? A company is not a person. It doesn't have any rights or any obligations. It doesn't. Like, what does it mean to sue a, an abstraction? That's that's crazy talk, right? So instead, if you had an oil spill and it, you know, ruined your house or you know destroyed your beach front property, um, you would have to sue the person responsible for it, which would be which would be the worker on the rig. Right? So the way it would work would be that the person liable for the mistakes would be the person that made it. The, 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 you know. So you would have workers that would be forced to pay um, for mistakes that they made. Now you can imagine, um, you know, in 19th century Britain, you know, the whole Dickensian era, um, maybe suing, you know, a textile worker or somebody that works in a bottle factory isn't really going to get you many... Um, you're not going to get much of a remedy from that because they're, the, I, the idea of a minimum wage didn't exist yet um, and they're basically slaves, right? So um, if you need a remedy, you're probably not going to get it from suing a slave, right? Instead, you would need to sue the slave's owner um, and, in fact... Um, that is why um, we have the rules around corporate personhood that we do, because the analogy to the slave's owner was what was used, right? And that's something else that exists in British case law. Um, you could not sue a slave because a slave was not a person. So if a slave did something illegal, you know, like kill someone or rape someone or, uh, you know, get something to eat when they're not supposed to, um, then it would be the owner that would be responsible, right? And the owner that would have to do the punishment or, you know, uh, make things whole, you know, do, do, do the, um, you mean, know, fix whatever was, uh, could compensate the victim for whatever the, whatever the concern was, right? Um, so by analogy, if the slave owner 
is responsible, then the company would have to be responsible as well. But, but, but the law had the reverse problem. And, and I do think that there are some parallels. I, I, I'm actually not entirely certain how this worked in the States. I've seen like an, a couple of like presentations by like Tom Hartman or something, but I mean like it's not... Uh, when you live in Canada, you study Canadian law. You don't study American law, right? And, and if things deviate like this, you learn the Canadian version. You don't learn the American version. So I'm not... You know, I mean, and, and I'm actually usually pretty good about figuring stuff like this out, but I don't... Uh, I know it has something to do with... Uh, uh, with corporations wanting special rights in the United States. And I know that uh, th that was a little bit later, right? Corporate personhood in Britain was an earlier thing. Um, like I say, it's, it's, it's considered important because it's, it's a part of the framework um, of, uh, of the switch to a bourgeois society. Um, but they had the opposite problem, right? When you were talking about slaves, you couldn't sue the slave because the slave wasn't a person. You couldn't sue a woman either because a woman wasn't a person. Um, so you had to sue the owner or the husband. Um, and, I mean, you can't sue a kid nowadays either, right? You have to sue, sue their parents instead, right? Um, so what do you do with the other way? You know, you, you want to sue the company, but the company's not a person. So we made up the idea that maybe a company could be a person. And by doing so, we granted the company standing. Okay? And in British tradition, it's actually not about companies getting special treatment, but about con companies being forced to be liable to pay damages. So the first case that brought in st uh, standing or corporate personhood in, in the United Kingdom and by extension in Canada... Um, had to do with um, somebody that was suing. Uh, I think it was a. I think it was a beer company, and there was a. I think I think it was a dead rat in the bottle. It might have been something else, but it was something nasty in a bottle, right? Um, and uh, actually, no, it wouldn't have been the rat. It was because there were actually damages that needed to be recouped. Something that made somebody sick or something. I can't remember what it was exactly. But but the point was to force the company to um, pay out damages. The judge awarded the plaintiff da uh, you know, damages and concluded that the company was liable. In order for that to happen, they had to make the company a person. Otherwise, it made no sense legally, right? Um, because they couldn't... I mean, e even if you could figure out who the slave was... Uh, or sorry, even even if you could uh, hold to the logic that it's the slave that should pay it, how do you even figure out who it was, right? And so does that mean nobody's liable if you can't figure out who's responsible, right? Um, and this is why I, I kind of push back a little bit against the rejection of corporate personhood. Um, in the British tradition, it's actually progressive um, to provide standing to a company um, to force them to pay liability costs. And like I said, the BP um, example is a good one because if you're forcing, you know, if you're focusing on specific workers in the rig, you're not going to get anywhere. But um, if you decide that okay, the company as a whole has to um, be held liable for the damages that they've created, um, environmentally, uh, ecologically, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, then um, you can actually get something done. Um, you know, if if your company's sorry, if your country's not run by a corny capitalist, anyways, in theory, um, unfortunately, not in practice um, for quite some time. <coughs> um, so I, I, I kind of actually think that corporate personhood, there's some there's some benefits to that. Um, maybe there's some uh, ways it can be tweaked a little bit, but as a concept. Um, I think maybe, maybe we might, might want to hold on to that. Um, the other thing that came in in the same ruling in the British tradition was the idea of shareholder liability. 
And together, these two things, corporate personhood and shareholder liability, are considered to make up the um, uh, ideological framework of, of bourgeois society um, in the British Empire. What corporate personhood means, um, and this was eventually legislated, um, you know, beyond the, the case law. What, um, sorry, did, did I say that right? What shareholder liability means, and it was eventually legislated, um, is that um, if, if a company goes bankrupt or has to pay charges or whatever else, then the shareholder is not responsible, right? Um, and the argument is that it, uh, it encourages risk, right? Um, which is just bullshit, right? Um, what what uh, shareholder... Um, did I say liability? That's what I'm looking for here. I think I screwed up that whole section. Um... I'm not going to go look it up, but there's a. The second part of the ruling was about shielding share, shareholders from liability. Um, what's the word I'm looking for here? When you can't be. Uh, when you're like immune. Shareholder immunity? I don't think that's the word I'm looking for, but, but let's go with it. Um, it was about shareholder Im immunity preventing liability. Um, the idea is that it stimulates risk, which is just bullshit. What it really is, is it's the. Um, bourgeois class literally legislating itself um, above the law, right? So it's the classic example of the collapse of the rule of law being at the very, very crux of bourgeois society. Um, what it means is that um, you could have, for example, um, a mining company that is operating in Central America um, that's raping villagers, burning people down, slaughtering people. Um, and the shareholders would not be responsible um, for any of that because um, that's just that's what, that's what the law says. Or you could say that uh, you could have a company that's like BP again um, that's responsible for environmental destruction, um, you know, gets forced to pay however much an EPA fines, um, or maybe one day might be held responsible um, for climate change and the um, you know economic and environmental catastrophe that that's going to be. Um, but the shareholders would not be held responsible no matter how much they put into it, right? Um, that to me is the part of capitalism um, that needs to be immediately removed, um, because I think that uh, in a situation like this, for example where shareholders are siphoning money out of the um, uh, retirement funds, um, the workers should have the legal remedy to go after shareholders and have them pay back what they took. The way the, way the system is designed is that shareholders can do things like this. They can just steal as much money out as they can and there's nothing anybody can do about it because they're legislated above the law. The rule of law does not apply to them because they're shareholders. And I really wish that every time somebody railed against corporate personhood, um, they would be going after um, a limited liability. That's the word I'm looking for. That, that's the technical legal term. They would, they would be trying to abolish limited liability instead. Um, this idea that it, it stimulates, I mean, like it's, it's based on a Wild West concept of markets that if it was ever true, it's not now, it's for sure. Um, if, if, there, if there was any ever any validity to it, it's pretty obsolete nowadays. Um, but I'm not sure there ever was any rule validity to it. I think it was just a really just an excuse. Um, because that's what I would like to see here. Right? I would like to see uh, all these pensioners get together, do a class action suit for the 
shareholders and have the shareholders put the money back in the pension fund uh, where it should be, right? The people that should have to suffer the consequences for the company going bankrupt should not be the pensioners, it should be the shareholders. But like I say, um, we live in a, in, a, in, a, in a reality where the legal system is stacked. Um, where shareholders have literally legislated themselves above the law and don't have to pay these sorts of consequences. It's a real easy way to you know, balance things out. And it's a really easy way to stop a lot of that from happening. But I mean, even that, you know, it's still not enough. The best way to ensure that people don't have their money stolen, um, and in, in, in fact, in this case, it's their labor stolen, right? What they're doing is they're taking their labor and they're putting it aside for later. It's to ensure that they have control of it. Right? It should be the unions that are running these sorts of things. But, uh, corporate personhood is a, I mean, I'm not, I'm not like a strong advocate of it or anything, but I think that, um, I, I, I find that, I find that the, the discussion lacking. You know, you hear a lot about abolishing it. Nobody really talks about the benefits of it or really provides any. See, I, I get the idea that people have ideas on what they can do to replace it, but it just never gets, you know, never gets articulated. You can't you can't just abolish corporate personhood and then go, you know, go whistling, you know, zippity doo -dah. Like that you, you have to replace it with something that gives corporations standing, right? Um, and however you do that, I don't know. Um, like I say, I, I, I've seen a real deficit of uh, of proposals. People just rail against it. They don't really provide much of an idea to to, to replace it, right? But uh, the whole uh, limited liability thing is just uh, not even discussed. Um, when I think that that's that's the real issue. That's the thing people should be going after is finding ways to. Uh, Make sure holders accountable to the law, because um, we've been living in a world for uh, about 200 years now, uh, 200 years in the British Empire, anyways, where shareholders don't have to face legal ramifications. They can get away with whatever they want because they're actually legislated above it, and that really like, it, it, it blows my mind that we've had this on the books for centuries. And um, as far as I can see, there's not even a movement against it. You know? You hear a lot of people talking about shareholders, you know, muttering mean things about them, you know, and contempt and everything. I haven't heard anybody articulate the abolishment of limited liability. At all. But, you know, we should hear a lot of it, I think. So that's two, uh, two things we get cracking on. Uh, maybe we can get some building, movement building going on around some things that matter. Kind of sick of hearing about identity politics. <laughs>